I come from Europe and I have traveled in almost all the states of India, from Ladakh to Tamil Nadu and from Mizoram to Gujarat. I have spent years trying to understand India's complex layers. There are probably more than a thousand reasons to love India, but it does not mean that we should refrain from discussing incidences of discrimination or racism in the country. I have noticed that some Indians think that all blonde people are from Russia. Likewise, some Indians assume that all light-skinned Indians are from Punjab, all people with mongoloid features are Nepali or Chinese, and all who have dark skin are from South India. But does it mean that these Indians are racially motivated and offensive? Absolutely not. Many just think that way innocently and many are just genuinely confused. For example, if you are a light-skinned Indian and if you travel to the northeastern region of India, many may think that you are not from India. In the northeast, a fair-skinned Indian can face remarks like you don't look like an Indian because your complexion is so light or are you a foreigner? Yes, some Indians who are very light-skinned can be referred to as a foreigner in their own country. When they visit historical monuments in the Northeast or anywhere else in India, they can even be asked for their passport or their national ID to prove that they are Indian nationals. If you are an Indian with a fair skin, similar things can also happen in South India and in some cases, you may even face a similar situation within your own city or state. Such incidents happen because on the basis of their individual experiences and understanding, many Indians have already formed a typical image in terms of what a typical Indian looks like. So, should we think that all the people who react in this way are racists? Of course not. India is so big and diverse that just like many foreigners, some Indians are also genuinely confused about what an Indian could look like. But it's not always about confusion or misunderstanding. There have been patterns of systematic racial abuse, discrimination and ethnic clashes within India. Avinash Pandey of the Hong Kong-based Asian Human Rights Commission writes, Meghalaya has had a long history of local tribal communities' unease against the outsiders, mostly Bengali, Marwari and Nepali Hindus, as well as against the Bengali-speaking Muslim. The Anis has often ended in violent attacks on them for over four decades now. Here it's important to mention that the so-called outsiders also consist of fellow Indians, many of whom have been living in Meghalaya for generations. Meghalaya's Chase the Outsiders Away movement resulted in the destruction of many Hindu temples, the total boycott of the Bengali Hindu businesses, daylight attacks on outsiders, and the brutal lynching of Bengali Hindus, which was followed by a massive exodus. Kolkata-based Samir K. Purkhyasta, who has worked for reputed newspapers in Northeast, stated, even during the relatively peaceful phase, stray incidents of attacks on non-tribals have been common. In 2013, within the span of a few months, two businessmen were set ablaze in two different areas of the city. Apart from these heinous attacks, non-tribal businessmen are also regularly extorted by various influential social organizations and militant groups in Magalia. I love India's northeastern region, as I have been there myself, but such unsettling stories can make anyone wonder, how come the God-fearing, church-going society of Meghalaya is behaving this way? Patricia Mary Makhem, editor of the Shillong Times and the recipient of Padma Shri, has something to say regarding the church in Meghalaya. She writes, I have never heard any preaching anywhere on extortion. Why? Is the church afraid of confronting sin? According to Patricia, some people have been living in fear as second-class citizens here for decades. Tribal fundamentalism is alive and kicking. So, what is the root cause of this tribal fundamentalism? Is this about protecting the tribal culture from outsiders and foreign cultures? 
Here in an email to the Shillong Times, BK Day Savian wonders why tribal communities of Megalia should worry at all about the influence of the so-called outsiders culture as the white, non-Indian outsiders have already homogenized the native cultures of Megalia by converting various tribal communities to Christianity, a religion which is not native to Megalia. So in that case, are the tribal groups fighting to preserve Christianity, a foreign religion which has already homogenized their own native cultures? Avalok Langer has spent years as a conflict journalist in the northeastern region of India. He quotes a Abinov, a non-tribal who was born and brought up in the northeast. Abinov stated, In Delhi, I get work based on my ability not my ethnicity, adding that in Megalia the discrimination has reduced from what it used to be in the 1990s, but that is because the non-tribal population has been reduced to such a minority that there is no one left to fight back. Violence against non-tribals is not just restricted to Megalia. In varying degrees this can also be observed in other northeastern states. Many migrant laborers from other Indian states have lost their lives in Manipur, a state which has witnessed the movement of Mayang Halo against non-tribals. According to Ashley J. Tallis, who is the senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Mayang is a term which is used in Manipur for mainland Indians. It is a term of derision and abuse. Similar terms are used for mainland Indians in other northeastern states too. According to Avlok Langer, non-tribals are referred to as the Khars in Shillong, Bangers in the Garo Hills, and Plain Manu in Nagaland. I was born and raised as a Christian in Europe. My husband is a Hindu from India. Together we have traveled a great deal in the northeastern region of India. I recall a strange incident that took place in Mizoram. The Mizo taxi driver who was showing us around Isol City said to my husband, Sir, what's your religion? Oh, you are a Hindu. It means that you don't have a soul in your body. My husband just smiled and chose not to respond. It is very important to mention that the tribal groups in the Northeast also suffer very severely from their own internal ethnic clashes. There is a long and systematic pattern of extreme violence and tensions between the Metes, Nagas, Kukis, and various other tribal groups of the Northeast. How shocking and unfortunate is that? On the other hand, when these people from the Northeast visit the other states of India, they also face discrimination. According to New Delhi-based The Rights and Risks Analysis Group, during the coronavirus pandemic, there has been an upsurge of racism against India's mongoloid-looking people. On its website, it has noted 22 incidents that have taken place in various parts of the country. One of them concerns an Amphil scholar from Manipur who was spat on and called coronavirus in New Delhi. According to the RRIG, the way forward for India is to enact an anti-racism law, but will the law be able to change people's minds? For example, many people from the northeastern states reside in various Indian states and often complain how people in mainland India use racist slurs against them. Without any element of doubt, calling people of northeastern origin by derogatory names should be enough for the offenders to be legally punished. But what should be done to those offenders who themselves appear to be unaware that such words are actually offensive? Here is a good example. Pause the video for a moment and read what is written on your screen. Not only should the use of derogatory words against people from the Northeast be stopped, but also more steps should be taken which can discourage people from stereotyping them on the basis of their eating habits or lifestyle. At the same time, it makes sense to punish those who break laws. We also need to understand that India is too big and diverse, not only for foreigners, but also for many Indians. The average Indian living in southern or northern India may not even be able to tell the names of major cities of the Northeast, and similarly, the average Indian living in the Northeastern region may not know much about other states of India. But hopefully, emergence of the internet and social media will bridge these gaps quickly. 
in its various forms, discrimination exists all over India. Discrimination that non Marathis face in Maharashtra, that North Indians face in southern states, and vice versa, as well as the common practice of looking down upon people from the states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and Jharkhand is all extremely unfortunate. But at least to an extent, mutual respect between various states and ethnic groups in India can increase if people attempt to educate themselves. Of course, you want to stop people who spread hate. But who is stopping you from spreading love and knowledge? For example, how many of us know that people from UP and Bihar are also known for their exceptional performance in India's civil service exam? Indians cheer for their army, but do all of them know that the migrant workers from these states contribute immensely to building roads for the Indian army in the Himalayas in extreme weather conditions? Yes, we shouldn't ignore the negatives, but how can we stay blind to the positives? Didn't we all see Mizo people winning everybody's hearts by helping the Assam flood victims? Didn't we all see people from Bihar offering food to passengers in an Assam-bound trade? Even the chief minister of Mizoram couldn't resist appreciating their sweet gesture. Now there is something that I would like to say to our non-Indian viewers. Just like other nations, Indians have their own serious internal matters but it doesn't mean that they don't stand united against the enemy or the opponent. The entire nation admires the heroics of Captain Nakes Hakuo Kangaroos of Nagaland in the Kargil War, and when the legendary boxer Marikom of Manipur represents India, the entire nation cheers for her. And by the way, if the general population in India really had hatred in their hearts for the mongoloid-looking people, then Sonam Wangchung wouldn't be receiving so much love, affection and admiration in India. He is an extraordinary man from Ladakh who today is like a national hero and a role model for many Indians. We should understand that India is a vibrant democracy and that is why almost all its strengths and weaknesses are there for everyone to see. We should also understand that it is the criminal mentality that is responsible for a crime. And that dangerous mentality can be found in almost all ethnic groups, communities and countries. Oftentimes, this is exploited politically or religiously. Our fight should be against the mentality, not against the communities or the people. Racism can strike in many forms, and some feel that in broad terms, stereotyping and implicit bias are a part of this too. Directly or indirectly, in one way or another, it is easy for many around the world to be guilty. When it comes to subjects involving such complexities, for a neutral observer like me, it might be difficult to come to conclusions. No matter how much I have learned so far, I still consider myself a student who is always willing to learn more. In our modern societies, racism should have no place. We should do our best to pursue things that can lead to positive cross-cultural engagement. But in relation to cross-cultural engagement, there is something that is worth exploring. On the one hand, many people love variety in cuisines, cultures, languages and physical features. But if you dig a bit deeper, then you will realize that these diversities actually exist because, to a large extent, Various groups live separately from one another for a period of time, developing their own individual habits, traditions and cultures. So, when we appreciate our diversities, we should not forget that we are appreciating something that was born due to the practices that may have discouraged cross-cultural engagement to a great extent. So, in a way, when we appreciate our diversities, is it correct to say that we are appreciating the outcome but criticizing the process that led to that outcome? If we love diversity, shouldn't we also remember what caused this diversity? Is it right to say that separation can also lead to diversity? Perhaps there are no easy answers. In our modern multicultural societies, how can multiple groups preserve their uniqueness while maintaining social harmony and enjoying a sufficient dose of cross-cultural engagement? Of course, we shouldn't ignore the fact that mixing cultures can also result in new diverse groups, new cultural habits and new cuisines. But as far as mixing cultures is concerned, who will decide that and for whom? 
will individuals decide for themselves? In that case, give this a thought. If all individuals in a group chose to go their own individual ways, will we be able to preserve the collective cultural identity of that group? Won't there be a competition between various foreign cultural movements or foreign religions to influence or even conquer such individuals ideologically? Isn't this happening already? Sub-nationalism in various regions of India appears to be rooted in the idea of safeguarding the land, local culture and traditions. But what can it do to protect people from the religious and commercial monocultures from the West which have homogenized and diluted hundreds of cultures and native traditions all over the world? Yes, in one way or the other, the power dynamics are always in play. After all, it's human nature. Coming back to racism. Yes, I condemn it very strongly. My family and I have been a victim of racism too. Let's do everything we can to stop this. Maybe being non-racist isn't sufficient. Let's also talk about being actively anti-racist. I love India for its diversity and its friendly people. Unfortunately, racists exist almost everywhere, including India. But when you compare the non-racist people of India to those of other countries, you will notice that Indians are exceptionally hospitable and welcoming. I love the northeastern region of India. For many reasons, it is truly a paradise. I literally fell in love with the region and its people. Want to know why? Then watch this episode. Namaste, my name is Karolina Goswami. I was not born in India, but through my logical reasoning and data-driven work, I have tried my best to present the sides of India which are lesser known or misunderstood. Please come forward and support my mission financially. Also, I highly recommend that you watch and share these two episodes. See you again.